Well, good morning. Now, when I grew up, uh, it was in a very large house with a very large garden and, uh, of course, three brothers and three sisters. The house was called St. Elmo's. And I don't think my father bought the house um, because he was planning on having so many children necessarily, but because he wanted to have enough room for a veterinary clinic. So throughout uh, my childhood, my dad used to work very hard day and night, you know, and out a lot of nights as well um, to do emergency calls and cattle and sheep and horses and things like that. Then he had a sort of small animal clinic at the house each evening. And while he was doing all that, mum, she looked after the accounts and the running of the house and uh, the running of the large garden as well as looking after seven children. So she had her hands full. On top of that, she was constantly answering the phone, sorting out the urgent calls, promising everyone who rang that dad would get to them as soon as he could. And I remember one famous occasion uh, where she wasn't there to deal with a farmer at the door and my dad was too tired to speak to the man. And so he told my sister, Maria, who must have been about seven or eight at the time, uh, to go to the door and to tell the farmer that he wasn't in. And so Maria, very happy to be given such a responsibility, proudly walked to the door and announced uh, what became immortal words in our family. My dad says to tell you he's not in. Well, no, I didn't mention mum's other job, which was to restrain dogs and cats in the surgery for the administration of anaesthetics and then to step in perhaps as a theatre nurse to hold an organ or something that needed to be held during an operation. And one day actually she popped her head around the door to make sure all was well in the surgery as she had left a visiting friend to do that job. And there she saw dad operating away on a dog and out cold at his feet lying on the floor was her friend who had fainted on being asked to hold a dog's stomach. <laughs> now, as more children arrived in the scene, eventually my mum was finally persuaded to hire someone to come in to help her out with all the, the work in the house, maybe do a little bit of house cleaning and uh, mum had resisted this for such a long time but eventually she agreed to have a lady called Marjorie come in on a Wednesday morning and do you know what my mum did every Tuesday night before Marjorie came in yep you guessed it she cleaned the house before Marjorie ever got there you know I was thinking about that this week and thinking again about the reason why many people will not be going back to church even when the buildings reopen again that's because they think that they have to get their lives cleaned up before they come. Now that's a bit like my mum thinking that she had to clean the house before the cleaner arrived. Let me tell you some really good news about all the dirt in your life that I wish I'd known many years ago. You aren't the cleaner of your life. Jesus is the cleaner. Now if folk out there think they have to change, have to reach a certain level of cleanliness before God will accept them. The saddest thing about that is that they got that idea from Christians. Somehow over 2000 years, we managed to take a message that said, receive Christ and be changed and replace it with one that says, you need to change in order to receive Christ. You know, the word gospel itself means good news, but for much of my life, it never sounded to me like good news because it wasn't given to me as good news, but rather good advice. And there is a world of difference. Good news is the news of something that has already happened that benefits me. Good advice can only be about something that hasn't happened yet, but might happen if I follow the advice. Can you see then that good news leaves your attention on what was done for you, but good advice leaves your attention on yourself your ability to follow the advice. Advice, therefore, leaves your hope on yourself. Do you know that when your hope is on yourself, your ability, your performance, then you have just made yourself your own savior, your own God. And that is the most exhausting, frustrating, burdensome, and ultimately the saddest life there is. Now, according to the Bible, that is exactly where mankind took a wrong turn. Now, you know the story well. There can't be anyone who hasn't heard it. A long time ago, the devil, whom Jesus called the father of lies, said to Eve in the garden, you can be like God yourself. Here is all you have to do. Eat the fruit of this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Now, can you hear what that is? That is advice. And in believing that advice to be true, Eve and then Adam looked to themselves 
and so put their hope not in God, but in what they could do to become like God. We could say they ate of the self-effort tree, and in swallowing that lie that they could be like God by themselves, they turned away from God as the source of their lives, and they looked to themselves as the source of life. And that turning inward, that looking to ourselves for life, is what all of us have been doing ever since, looking to make a life for ourselves. Now, we could call that a self-life, because it is a life that revolves around ourselves. Now, from the outside, it has a certain glamour and attractiveness about it. After all, you get to be in charge and you get to call all the shots. And the world idolises this type of life and continually lifts up before us for our adulation men and women who appear to have made great lives for themselves, the rich and famous self-made men and women. Their lives appear so great from the outside that we naturally think, now that's really living. I just need to do what they did and I too can have a life like that. Unfortunately, there are a couple of fundamental problems with the self-life. The self-life can only ever produce a self-ish life because all my decisions are based on what will benefit my life. But what do you get if you put millions of people living together who are all looking to benefit their own lives? You get a selfish world where for every one who appears to have made it to a great life, there are many, many others who lost out on the race to the top of the heap. Now, there's another problem with the self-life. Because we were not made for ourselves, not made for a self-life, but rather were made to know life as God knows life, then no matter how successful people appear to be, they can never reach a place of being satisfied or feeling that they really have life or even know what life is. I remember my father once telling me the story of some reporters who were interviewing the richest man of the world at that time, which was a man called John Rockefeller. Uh, he was a billionaire. And one of the reporters asked him, how much money will be enough, Mr. Rockefeller? And he thought for a moment and then he replied, just a little more. You see, with the self-life, you'll never find peace because your life will be driven to always need just a little more. And as you are the source of your life, that hunger just pushes you further into self-effort, further into the self-ish life. Trying to find life through what you do is like trying to put out a fire by throwing petrol on it. You know, when you regard yourself as your source of life, in effect, your own God, then it will always seem to you that if you could only just discover the right thing to do and manage to do it, then you would have life. Can you see what that is? That's you and I still eating of the wrong tree, still believing the lie that if only we had more knowledge about the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do, then we could do all the right things we need to do in order to really live life to the full, really know life as God knows life. But have you noticed yet? Eating of that tree has never caused you to grow on the inside. All your best efforts to do more or do better never caused you to grow in love or joy or peace or patience or even self-control. They never caused you to grow in the life of God. You may have been eating from that tree for so many years, what we could call the self-effort tree, that right now you're probably expecting me to give you some advice on what you need to do in order to sort your life out. I'm not going to give you one piece of advice. I'm not going to throw any more petrol on a fire that has consumed you for years but never brought any real light or warmth into your heart. Instead, I'm going to give you some simple truths. One simple truth, in fact, that will fall in your hungry heart, not as good advice, but as good news. And here it is. True life, as God knows life, is not found through knowing what to do. It is found through knowing God, and he freely gives that knowledge to all who want it. Now, I have found in my life for many years that I was so consumed with being right by myself that I couldn't hear the gospel is good news. My self-dependency could only ever hear it as good advice. Let me say that in a different way. I was too religious to take in what God was saying to me. My hope was so much in myself and my behavior that it was only when all hope in myself was exhausted that I began to look higher than myself for life. You know, the Lord's so gracious and so patient with us. 
He never forces us to come to him, even though he may watch us making a mess of our lives for years. He knows that what we really need is not advice. We don't need to know more advice. We need to know him. For knowing him is the eternal life, the real life that he always wanted for us. In fact, you can read Jesus saying just that in John 17 verse 3. He said this to the Father, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Can you hear that God's definition of life isn't about what you do, but about who you know? You know, one of the most amazing things about the Bible is that it proves itself to be true because you can open it and read your own story there. You know, when I read Jesus' account of the prodigal son, I find myself always recognizing myself in that story. And I find that the words of Jesus speak directly into my life and set me free from the curse of the self-effort tree. Now, again, there can't be many people who haven't heard this story. It's known as the prodigal son, and you can read it in Luke chapter 15. And there you can read your story and my story. You see, Jesus tells the story of a father who had two sons, and both sons were hungering to be someone, to find the good life. And both thought that the answer to their hungry hearts could be found through what they could achieve in life. In other words, they could find life themselves. Now, if you remember the story, the younger son leaves home after demanding that his father give him the inheritance that should only have been his after his father died. So in effect, he was saying to the father, I want to live as if you're dead. I want to make a life for myself. He then proceeds to do all the things with that money that he thinks will bring him the good life he craves. You know, he spends money on the high life, but when his money runs out, so does his friends. And he's finally left empty and all alone. Now, you could say that from a Christian perspective, he does all the wrong things. But, you know, the big shock of the story for me is that the other son, uh, the good boy, you could say, the one who sought to find the good life by staying at home, working hard, doing all the right things, he also ends up empty, alone, and very angry. You see, the point is, whether you do all the right things or all the wrong things, you can still end up empty and alone, because despite what this world has told you all your life, doing all the right things is not the way into the right life. God's life for you. And believing that it is has left so many people very religious all their lives and yet they've ended up bitter and alone because their faith was actually in what they were doing for God rather than in what he had done for them. They had been living on good advice, not good news. Now we could say one is earthly food and one is heavenly food. Earthly food can never satisfy. I mean within a day you're hungry again. The last thing you need today is more earthly food, more good advice. You need good news, heavenly food. Jesus said it this way, Man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that keeps proceeding from the mouth of the Father. Isn't that beautiful? You see, to hear God speak to you as your Father is not to hear of who you could be one day if you do this or that. It is to hear who you are today because Christ did what you or I could never do. Save you from yourself. Now, maybe you're like the younger son, the prodigal, who years ago, in effect, you said to God, I'm going to live as if you're dead. I'm going to make a life for myself. Or maybe like me, you were like the elder son who just kept trying to do the right things and avoid the wrong things, but ended up really empty, frustrated, and not a little angry at God, because no matter how hard we try to do the right things, it never seems to be enough to earn us his life. But what if the truth was that God was never looking for you or I to save ourselves by doing all the right things? What if he knew that all we ever needed was to simply receive the life that he had always freely gave us, the life of a perfectly loved son? You see, if you read that story in Luke 15, you'll see that by the time the younger son arrived home in rags and smelling of the pigs he'd been looking after, he was still trying to save himself by what he could do. 
he pleaded with his father, let me work for you as a servant and pay you back what I owe you. But the father could not allow him to go there, for that would have been to send him back to the self-effort tree, wouldn't it? Instead, the father didn't even answer him. He just started to dress him once again as only a son, not a servant, should be dressed. And I really feel that's what the gospel does. The gospel of God's grace addresses you, dresses you as a son, not as a slave. You know, the father, he gave that son the best robe in the house, his own ring, and he put shoes on his feet because in those days, only servants went barefoot. So can you see what the father was seeing as he looked at his son? He was seeing his son as someone whose greatest need wasn't to know what to do, but to know who he was. The son of a father who loved him so much that all the father had was already his. Now here is the only truth that can set you free from yourself and a life of self-effort. All that you will ever need for life and godliness was already given to you in the gift of Christ's life. Now let me say that in the words of the Apostle Peter. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That's 2 Peter 1 verse 3. You see, to know Jesus lived and died for you is to know that the Father has never withheld anything of himself from you. Now that can be hard to accept, I know, when you've spent your whole life seeing other people apparently enjoying a great life and seeing yourself end up with nothing after all your efforts. But in Jesus' story of the homecoming of the prodigal, the father throws a lavish party for the younger son. And when the elder son finds out about it, he's so angry that he can't even go into the house. And when his father hears that his elder son has excluded himself from the celebration, he goes out to him to ask him to come in. And full of anger, the elder son just spits out his hurt into his father's face. I've worked like a slave for you for years and you never give me anything for all my efforts. You see, he hadn't entered into his father's party because he was having one of his own, a pity party. Only a self-life can have a pity party. Now, there's someone needs to hear that again this morning. Only a self-life can have a pity party. And that's why there are no pity parties in heaven because there are no self-lives there, only the one shared life of Father, Son, and Spirit. You see, believing that lie that our Father in heaven has always withheld his life from us only ever birthed in us a selfish life. And God knows that, and that is why Christ and him crucified, the giving of his Son, is the truth that sets us free from that lie that fathered our separated from God life, that selfish life. If you look carefully again at that story of the prodigal son, you will see Jesus describing the father giving his property to both sons right at the beginning of the story, not at the end of the story. Now you might say, what's that got to do with me? When did God the father ever give anything of his to me? When? Well, again, if you've been waiting for years thinking that one day at the end of your life, at the end of the story, he will finally give you something, you may want to take a second look at the gospel. The Bible says that God was actually in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. In other words, when we see the outstretched arms of Jesus on the cross, those are the arms of our heavenly Father, embracing us in all our sin. And just as the father of the prodigal son didn't stand back from the stench and the filth of the separated life of a son, but ran to him with arms open wide and buried his son in himself, wrapping his life around his son. So too, Christ and him crucified was the father's outstretching his arms around you and I and burying us in himself. The lie that God is the one who stands back from you, withholding his life from you until you get your life cleaned up that lie birthed in you a separated from God life, which is nothing but suffering and death. But to see the truth by the power of the Spirit, to see Christ and him crucified 
as the Father withholding no good thing from you, not even his own life. That truth, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, births in you and fathers in you the life that God always had for you, the shared life of a father who doesn't know any other sort of life or love, but that which shares all he has with you. For he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's Romans 8 verse 32. When in your mind, your thinking, your theology, you shackle God's love for you to your performance, what you have done is shackle yourself, chain yourself to your own record. You know, the father had to go out to the elder brother because that son couldn't leave the fields to come in. He couldn't leave the fields because he couldn't disconnect himself from his life's work, his record. He defined his own worth by what he had done. He was saying, in effect, to his father, I want you to judge us on the basis of what we have done. My younger brother doesn't deserve to be blessed by you, but I do. Just look at how much I have done for you down the years. Can you hear how he is defining his life and it's worth by what he has done. And that's the cry of all who eat from the self-effort tree. It's a cry to be judged on their works. For when you're a self-made man, your works are your life. Now, how about you? Do you believe your works to be your life before God? Do you feel that given all you've sacrificed for him and all your best efforts to do the right things in life, that you deserve his blessing? I mean, would it disturb you to find him sharing his life, his love, his blessing with people who never did one thing in their lives to deserve the name Christian? If you can't join in God's joy over them, if you can't come out of your pity party, take it from me, it's because you haven't yet disconnected yourself, your life, from your record. Here's the gospel. Christ disconnected you from your record 2,000 years ago at the cross in order that you could enter into the joy of your Father over you, a joy that never saw you as what you did and never called you after your works, but according to his grace and purpose given to you in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. Far from not being generous toward you, your Father in heaven never wanted to give to you on the basis of your works because that would have shackled his giving, limited his giving to your performance, your self-life. And he always had a much more generous plan, one that would allow him to give to you as much as he wanted to, even all that he has. And that plan was this. He would give to you not on the basis of your small self-centered life, a life called what you did for him, but on the basis of the greatest holiest life in all creation, a life called what he did for you, Christ. Now, ask yourself, on the basis of which life would you like to be judged, to be defined, your life for him or Christ, his life for you? Which tree do you want to eat from, the self-effort tree or the tree of life? You see, to continue eating from the first you must remain living a separated from God life, a self-life, a religious life, which revolves around you and your work for him and all your efforts to clean up your life in order one day to be holy enough to deserve your father throwing a party for you. <laughs> to live that life is to live a life fathered by a lie. But to eat from the tree of life, you must allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes today to see that even if you spent a thousand lifetimes religiously trying to clean up your self-life, that selfish life can never be holy in God's sight because to him, that is not life. Knowing him is life and to know him and Jesus Christ whom he has sent is to know that he is not the father who ever withheld himself from you. And that truth, the truth of his love pouring into your heart by his spirit. That truth allows you to live a life fathered by the spirit of truth, the life of a perfectly loved son. Far from not celebrating you, God's party over you started a long time ago. 
He's not the one preventing you from entering into his joy. It's the fact that you have shackled yourself, chained yourself to your do-it-yourself, save-yourself life that is estranging you from the joy of the Father. You and I are the ones who distance ourselves from him every time we turn away from Christ and him crucified as the truth about how much he loves us and instead point to our lives, our behaviour and insist on believing that the things we have done should be the measure of his love for us. You know, the elder brother estranged himself. You could say he socially distanced himself from the house of the father, from knowing his father and his father's love and joy, his father's celebration over him. And right now on the earth, social distancing has separated families and communities in order that they don't catch something that might kill them. But you know, in the realm of the spirit, child of God, when you socially distance yourself from the mind of God by insisting on shackling yourself to your life's work, your record, you miss catching something that is going to strengthen you, not kill you. The joy of the Father over you, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, it's your very life. You know, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, he warned them that when believers start to try and earn the grace of God, they actually estrange themselves, distance themselves from the grace and power of God. Now Jesus ended that story of the prodigal son with the father coming out from that party with great compassion and coming down into the fields and declaring the truth to his elder son. And I love declaring his words because a few years ago they changed my life because these words called me out of the fields of religion and away from the self-effort tree. Remember the father said, Son, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. Now, have you ever noticed about that story, something strange? It appears unfinished. Jesus doesn't tell us if the elder brother entered into the father's celebration or not, whether he believed the father or not. Why didn't Jesus tell us? Why didn't he finish the story? Perhaps because the story was not his to finish. It is for each of us to finish that story. So I'm going to finish now by simply reading out to you again the words that Jesus said the father spoke out over that angry, disappointed elder son. And if you can hear these words today as being spoken in this moment by our heavenly father to you, then you can be set free right now from the lie that has kept you eating from the wrong tree, the self-effort tree all your life the lie that God the Father has withheld himself from you. Whoever you are this morning, if you can receive these words as the Father's personal invitation to you, then the Holy Spirit is gifting you right now the grace to be disconnected from your self-life, the grace to leave your pity party and enter into the joy of your Heavenly Father who lives in the truth that he has shared all he has with you in the gift of Christ. This is what the Father is saying to you. My son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. God bless you. Well, thanks for watching today. And if you really felt something spoke to you today or touched you, feel free to get in touch. And you can do that by just searching River City Church Ireland on Facebook or on YouTube. And I just really believe that as you're just listening to these messages, that something is changing in your life because the word of God never returns to him void. God bless you.